Hey guys, welcome back to another one of my reaction videos and today's video is going to be really, really long. So about two weeks ago, I went to the theater with my friend to watch Jujutsu Kaisen Zero movie or movie zero. Zero movie. And I can't believe I have to wait six months after they release it in Japan because usually it doesn't take us this long. I don't know what it is, probably COVID or the economy of my country, I, I have no idea but yeah, we probably the one of the last country that get to watch this in theater. So I've never done a movie review before. I usually don't watch movie review so I don't, I don't know what they usually talk about but I'm just gonna say what I was thinking while I was watching this movie, okay? So, overall picture, it was great. The art style, the color, animation, even the soundtrack. Everything was amazing, as expect of MAPPA. Okay, first thing first, if I look down, it's because I have my note right here. I can't remember everything, so I have to write it down, and now I'm reading off of it, okay? So, it was great. I was not disappointed. A lot of people said it was one of the best um, movie adaptation of a manga they have ever seen. It was not that for me, but it's still pretty good, okay? Really good, actually. I thought the plot was a bit rushed at first, just in the first act. Understandable, because there's a lot to be told in this movie. And I think the pacing for the rest of the movie was fine. So yeah, it, it was not bad, it was just feel a bit rushed in the beginning. Oh wait, by the way, I forgot. Spoiler alert for the entire video. I don't know when I'm going to start spoiling things. So if you haven't watched the movie, which I doubt you haven't, um, yeah, just saying everything is a spoiler. There are a lot of emotional scenes in the movie. I heard that some fans even shed tears for Yuta and Dika. I was pretty emotional too, but for another reason. We'll talk about that. So, the first act. The first act was kind of parallel to what Yuji went through in the first two or three episodes in the anime, right? I don't want to compare, you know, the two protagonists, but it's unavoidable. There might be people who watched the movie and was like, wait, isn't it exactly the same thing that Yuji went through? But because I already know that, or knew, that originally Yuta was supposed to be the protagonist before Akutami Sensei decided to change him to Yuji. So I didn't see these scenes as, oh, this is what happened to Yuji, but rather, oh, this is how it's supposed to happen if Yuji didn't exist. It's like, it's like another universe or another story completely. So to me, this is more like a, this is what Akutami Sensei originally planned. I think they try to show us how OP our main characters are by showing us in the beginning what they are capable of. For Yuta, it's the gruesome scene where Rika almost killed his bullies. And next is the scene where I kind of hope to see in the anime, but it's fine because they put it in here, which is the scene where the higher ups order Gojo to get rid of Yuta. I actually like this scene for some reason. Maybe it's because we finally get a glimpse of the higher up, you know, because before this, I thought the higher ups are just like the principals of each school, which doesn't really make sense. But now they seem a lot more mysterious. Like you can't actually guess who they are. I mean, they can be anyone in this field of work. Another reason why I like this scene is because it shows us how much Gojo care for his students or, you know, the kids who struggle with uh, the burden of their curse power or the curse ability, regardless of who they are. The higher up want to execute Yuta because he's too powerful, right? That's how they perceive him, like, oh, he's too powerful, he's gonna be dangerous. And Gojo was like, do you want to kill every child who have strong curse power? Like, where's the logic? 
And in the anime, I thought Gojo only treats Yuji nicely because he likes Yuji as a person. You know, he likes Yuji bubbly and energetic personality. But apparently, he didn't lie when he said he's a good teacher who care for his students. Judging by how he treats Yuta, almost exactly the same way how he treat or will treat Yuji. Even though these two kids have polar opposite personality and motivation. If you watch my reaction video, you know that I'm not really crazy for Gojo, right? I mean, he's cool and I like how OP he is, but I don't really care for him. Sorry. But after this scene in the movie, I feel my respect for him increase a bit. And by the end of the movie, I genuinely care for him. The way he convinced Yuta to join their school by telling him that shutting yourself in will be very lonely was really convincing and also emotional at the same time. It's not just, hey, you're powerful and we can help you. He actually tried to connect with this kid and knowing a bit more of Gojo's past, I think this is basically Gojo projecting himself onto Yuta. Like, he knows exactly how lonely and miserable that can be. Like, he himself is powerful, but, you know, at the end of the movie when he said like, that, you know, a certain character is his only friend, his, his childhood or his in his youth, he's probably also felt lonely too. Then they cut to Yuta waking up and preparing for his first day of Jujutsu Hai, right? This scene, the music was amazing. For some reason, I thought this was Utada Hikaru at first. Maybe it's because she just uh, sing a couple of songs or maybe just one song, I don't know, for the most recent Evangelion movie. And since Yuta, Yuta's voice actor is also voice actor for Shinji from Evangelion, I got confused for a moment. However, the song was good, was really, really good. You know, talking about keep on living and moving forward was really emotional. After all, we just saw what happened to Yuta. Oh, and I forgot to talk about the character design. Love it. This new or old, old look of the second years, who were then first years, it was, it was great. It was refreshing. I mean, I already liked the, the design of the second year, but this is, this is also nice. Um, Inumaki looked more boyish and fun with his hair up. I don't know which hairstyle of his that I like more, but it's almost like he's a different person just, just changing his hairstyle. I think the, the, the design that we saw in the anime makes, makes him look kinda you know, more calm, even though his, his character is not calm at all. Oh, but Maki, I like her hair in this movie more than the one in, anim uh, in the anime. I think I already said this when I react to the trailer, but I think she's, she's cool either way. Her size web bang and her outfit in this movie just look even cooler. Or at least for me, okay? Panda still looks like Panda. All of his Exce accessory? Accessory. Accessory still has Panda logo on it. And <laughs> I think that's really funny. Talk about the second years. You know what? I'm gonna call them the students to avoid confusion because they were first year in this movie. The students. I already like their dynamics uh, without Yuta, you know, in the anime. So I kinda already expected to like them even more with Yuta or when Yuta joined. Which I did! Their chemistry was great. The thing that I worry about in the beginning of the movie was the comedic element because in the anime, in the series, I mean the comedy part was great, right? The balance, uh, the action, the serious part and the comedy part really well. But the comedy in the anime it mostly because of Yuji. He's the funny one in his friend group, right? So since Yuta is kind of gloomy and his 
backstory was super tragic. I can't like in the beginning, I couldn't imagine how this movie can be funny, and I wasn't sure if they still going to keep making jokes or adding like funny elements like they usually did or not. My guess was uh, the only two characters that probably going to keep being uh, like funny or silly is Gojo and Panda. But surprisingly, this dude did really well with the comedic uh, com com comedic part, comedy parts. I actually laugh a lot throughout the movie. Even Yuta, who I thought was going to be sad and gloomy the entire time, was actually quite funny. He didn't like try to be funny or cracking jokes like Yuji, but the timing of the comedy was was great, and they were able to like made him participate in the comedy. I, I, I can't explain it, but yeah, apparently it, it, it's still funny. Yeah, just him being naive and dense in. A serious situation is already hilarious. You know when Ghetto first show up at their school and everyone was like, "Oh no, enemies, dangerous!" and he was like, "Oh, Big Bird." <laughs> okay, next part. I didn't read the manga, so I don't know which scenes are additional scene that was not in volume zero, except for Nanami scene. But we'll get into that later. <laughs> the way characters. Slowly explain information about curse and stuff it makes it really easy for people who knew nothing about the show to understand. Like, you don't have to watch the first season or read the manga before watching this movie to be able to understand. You can go in completely blind and still, I think you will still, you still, you will still be able to enjoy it. And this is Jujutsu Kaisen. A show where almost every detail need an explanation, but it's yeah, it's pretty easy to understand in the movie. A lot of people, or at least where I live, bring their parents or their um, friends who not into anime to watch the movie with them. And so far, I haven't heard any complaints. So yeah, it's it's anyone can watch this <laughs> basically. Now the part. Where they show us Yuta and Rika's story, where they passed and their relationship. It was emotional for sure, tragic. But the pacing, like I said, the first act, the pacing of the first act was so fast. By the time that they show us Ghetto, I was like, oh, so it's time for another backstory of a different character. Like, just give me a moment. Even the part where Yuta and Maki was rescuing the two kids, two boys, they were arguing, right? And the 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 thing that they were arguing about was important. It means something. It's helped the story progress and kind of help develop Yuta's character. Like this is this is the moment where we can see his character's growth. But it was so fast, and then suddenly Yuta was able to come to terms. With himself, but like I said, I understand there's a lot to be told in this movie, and they can't make like a three hours long movie. But because of this pacing, half of the movie was about Ghetto and his ideology to the point where I forgot about Rika like for a moment or two. Talk about talk about Rika. Oh, I have a problem. I I feel like when I'm speak English, I supposed to call her like Rika, but <laughs> I I can't. Nika, talk about Rika. I really like how every time she appear, like I mean, uh, her curse form appear, or when something important happen, there always this text like back screen with white text explain the situation along with the type writer typewriting typewriter sounds. I mean, they are also did this in the first season too, and I like that. It reminds me of like a news report, so it's kind of give off eerie vibe and show how serious the situations are. Just like before Yuji die, remember at the juvenile detention center, and I think 
for that reason, these texts and sound already conditioned me to to be afraid of what was happening or what is about to happen. Like you know, it's a big deal when Rika appear or, or came out full body, and they have to. They feel the need to tell us that on this date, this special grade curse came out. So it's almost like they try to tell us that hey, this is a big deal. This is not normal. This is dangerous. This is an important event. Oh gosh! Now, in this scene where Rika or Rika, you know, the curse form was fully summoned, I can't help but wondering if that is Rika. Then who the heck is this? Like the little girl form? Like was you thought like hallucinating? It doesn't make sense to me. Isn't the curse supposed to be Rika? Then. <laughs> and I was confused until the end, at the end of the movie, where it was um, revealed by Gojo that Rika, you know, Rika, the the curse was made by Yuta's curse power, curse power or curse ability. I'm not sure if I understand this right or not, but I think this Rika, you know, the the little girl and Rika, the curse, are not the same being. Judging by their personalities, Rika the curse seems to be more childish and easily jealous, while Rika the real Rika is more mature and understanding. She even appeared to encourage Yuta and want to keep, uh, want him to keep on living without her at the end. So yeah, I think I think my theory is that the real Rika was actually with Yuta. All these times since the day she died, but this is not her. This is just a curse that trapped her inside. Like Rika was stuck with Yuta, right? But Yuta's curse kind of create this thing to trap Rika with him. Does that make sense? That's my theory. I probably wrong. I don't know. Okay, next, their choice of making Yuta using a curse tool like a sword is very interesting. It's a good way to not like give away gi give give away the fact that he's actually has curse power inside him because they been tricking us since the beginning that Yuta was cursed right we we thought we all thought Yuta was cursed he doesn't have curse power in him like other Jews or sorcerer so yeah like I said made him use a sword or a curse tool is a good way to hide the fact that he has curse power in him from us Honestly, I can't imagine Yuta fighting without curse tools at all. Like, can you imagine him running around punching curses like Yuji does? Cause I can't. I can't. Next, the combat training scene. First of all, love Mikey's outfit. There's something about seeing girls kick asses while wearing skirts. Not in a pervert way. It's just cool. Like. You know, as a girl, you want to look cute, but like people often say that wearing skirt was not appropriate. So, yeah, I I kind of like seeing girls doing like a action stuff while wearing skirt. And I know that Akutami Sensei has this policy about no fan service. So I like that Maki was jumping around in this short skirt that. Turn out to be a skirt. <laughs> Is that how you pronounce it? Is that how you call it? Like half skirt, half shorts. Love this detail. Truly <laughs> family friendly. And oh, and I've heard that a lot of people um, ship Yuta and Maki. And I have to say, after seeing this movie, I totally understand why. The scene in the third act where they discuss. Marky's reason for wanting to be Jujutsu Sorcerer was great too. I, uh, I mean, we already knew that from the anime, right? Because Marky had this conversation with Nobara before. But I guess it's their conversation, like Yuta's response and Marky's reaction, that made this scene even more emotional, in my opinion. And the panda's revelation. Scene was also pretty funny, and even though you the character was kind of awkward, um, his relationship and chemistry with others 
characters are pretty good in my opinion. The scene where he went on a mission with Inumaki was pretty wholesome. He couldn't understand a word that Inumaki said, yet he was able to tell that this guy was truly nice and considerate, considerate person. And man, I really love seeing Inumaki using his, his power. I can watch like a compilation of, you know, him saying curse word all day. It's so cool. Now, the second act of the movie, Geto Suguru. When people call him a cult leader, I thought it was a joke. It was not. He was actually a cult leader. I'm not gonna lie. I love the cult part. Love it. Love him. I know I shouldn't, but you know. <laughs> Even when he start calling human uh, who don't have curse power as monkeys, I was like, well, monkey it is. I can be monkey. He was very different from what we saw in the anime, but I thought I don't know, I feel like something happened to him before uh, he came back in the first season because this is a prequel, right? So something must have happened between uh, the, the movie and the first season because he is so extra in this movie. Like his behavior is totally different from what we're used to. And I know he's supposed to be the villain or the bad guy, but I can't say I completely dislike him. Listen, at first he reminds me of Thanos, which I can't completely disagree with. But the more I think about it, Geto's mission is kind of eugenic, right? Like the thing about only strong people just survive and the rest should get rid of. So, yikes. <laughs> oh, and seeing him swallowing uh, curses, I think they are they curse, right? They are curses. That was so unsettling. I mean, Yuji also eat curse object, but it's different. Like, this is his choice. Next, the thing about the night parade of 100 demons. I think I talked about this before. I try to look it up, like the myth, because I know that Akutami Sensei love to use actual like myth, myths and legends in his story. Like Sukuna, Sukuna was like based on a real being in a, a Japanese lore. So I try to look up this Night of Hundred Demons, and I think it was. Uh, but I thought this night of hundred, the night parade of hundred demons, supposed to be a summer night because you know according to Japanese superstitions, ghosts usually come out during summer. That's why they often tell ghost story during summer festival or summer in summer camp, and even. I, I, I don't want to quote Wikipedia, but like in Wikipedia, they're like, yeah, this night was supposed to happen during summer. But in the anime, in the anime, it was in, in, on, on October 31st. So I thought, okay, that makes sense because Halloween, right? But then in the movie, it's December 24th and I was confused. So I was trying to predict or try to find the reason while I was watching the movie, you know, I was thinking maybe it's about time and place because holidays, you know, people will come out to hang out and it will be easy, uh, I mean, harder for the sorcerer to get rid of the curse. But then the Jesus sorcerer, they're able to evacuate people, like have, we, have no problem dealing with people. So I don't know, did they ever explain why or is this night just this night could be any night that get her sh sh shoes maybe they just chose these two days because it's easier for the audience to remember like oh on halloween and christmas eve maybe anyhow it doesn't matter what's matter was the tiny glimpse into gojo and get her's backstory. We were spoiled uh, from the trailer that they actually knew each other, right? And they probably went to school together. So I was already braced myself for that. 
but like what's going on for real i said in the beginning of this video that um like most people i also got emotional while watching this movie but instead of crying for yuta and rika my brain just can't move on from gojo and geto like what happened what's going on i don't fully understand everything i think they're gonna reveal later in later season or if you read the manga you probably already know yeah i don't fully understand everything but just knowing that they were once friends and seeing them you know based on gojo flashback i think they switch their ideology and went on different paths you know when gojo heard geto uh, geto's voice saying stuff about protecting people who are weaker or people who don't have cursed power and now it's gojo who tried to protect human and geto tried to destroy humanity that just that made my heart hurt <laughs> now into the third act the action i'm going to explain in a list because there's so much that i want to say number one geto's ability judging from the fact that he can summon and control curses i think it's because he eats curses i can see why he's one of the most fear juzu sorcerer or curse user not to mention the fact that he can use curse tool and also good at close range combat fight is combat fight mean you fight like hand to hand number two gojo calculating get ho's move apparently i don't know that gojo is smart like he actually used his brain in a fight because if i was that powerful i would not even think i probably constantly like snapping my finger to annihilate everything i thought he's gonna be that type of person but no he's actually smart right he also probably doesn't want to kill the sorcerer on the opposite side right because judging from what we saw so far i'm sure he can kill all of them but i would like to believe that he chose not to plus this also show how well gojo knows geto like he was calculating the others the others move like man they actually friends ah <sighs> number three geto calling rika as the queen of curse like i see what you did there i see what you did there akutami sensei number four serpent eyes and fang speaker i you know my kid was born with it and there are also like danger that came with his ability but you thought was like you know what i can replicate a speaker that can do the same thing i can't i i, I can't yuta is starting to become too op and at first i was confused i thought inumaki gave it to him but then geto tried to explain <laughs> i guess explain to us that oh because he can control rika and rika can like manipulate her her curse power to like create a speaker for yuta but once i know that rika was yuta's curse power manifesting into this form i was like so the speaker is also your power like yeah number five ino meme and nanami sang it's weird i should call meme as meme sang too or sh i should call nanami as nanami i'm not sure about meme's action sequence but i'm pretty sure that ino and nanami are not like their scene are not in the manga i think they added in just for people who already watched the anime or read the manga because they didn't waste time explaining who these characters are they just go straight to the badass action scene so that's why i think this is just not just but i think this is a service scene for people who already watched the anime or read the manga and I mean, I already like Mei Mei f just from the glimpse of her in the first season. Like the her character design was really cool. But now I'm actually in love with her. Like I need to see more of her. So cool. By the way, is this the time where Nanami was able to unleash or use Black Flash four times in a row? I think so. I saw him use 
Black Flash, if I'm not mistaken. One thing though, I thought we are going to see Ichichi in action. I don't know what is he capable of, but um, I think his character has so much potential. I guess we have to wait and see. We'll see. Number five, Gojo is badass. I guess he truly is the best. Next, number six. I know I said I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't compare Yuta and Yuji, but Yuta's character is still pretty gray in my opinion. You know, Yuji, he tried to do the right thing. You know, typical protagonist trope archetype, but for you that I think what he stand for doesn't necessarily make him a good guy. I mean he's not a bad person, he didn't do anything bad intentionally just because he loves his friend and want to protect his friend. Like the bad guy also loves his friend and want to protect them, yet that doesn't make him a good guy either. And he said it himself, Yuta. He told Geto that I don't know if you're right or wrong because I don't know other sorcerer outside this school, but for me to be able to stay with my friend, I have to kill you. You know, his character is pretty humanized, humanizing. You know, like human do good thing, bad thing. People, people will do anything to protect other people who are on their side. And I'm not blaming him for anything, I'm just saying. But because of this, I can't help but think without other students or if Ghetto get to him first before Gojo did, would things be any different? Yuta's reason to fight Ghetto was pretty meh. Like, this guy, this guy want to steal your cursed girlfriend and your reason for fighting him is you try to kill my friend? And I can't live without my friend, so I have to kill you. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a good reason. But the juxtaposition of these two are not very clear. So after a while, I was like, why, why are you fighting again? I'm sorry. But hey, I might be wrong. There might be a deeper metaphorical meaning in this fight that I don't get. And if that's the case, please kindly explain that to me in the comments. And oh, Black Flash, it was so subtle. I almost didn't notice at first. I thought I just imagining stuff, but I'm pretty sure Yuta can unleash his Black, Fla Bla Black Flash. Yeah. He also starting to get, starting getting, he's starting to getting better at doing physical stuff. Does that make sense? Is that sentence make sense? Like, you saw him jumping off a balcony into like a pool and like doing backflip when three months ago, he can't even catch up after Maki and Inomaki in a practice. So like I said, I think he's getting too OP too fast. Not that I complain, he's supposed to be OP and I understand. And remember when I said that his morality is still pretty gray because he did not hesitate to kill Ghetto at all. I'm not judging, I'm just saying Yuta knew full well that Ghetto is also human. But he's like, you know what? I'm gonna kill you because I can't and you are the enemy. Not judging, just saying. What number are we at now? Seven? Seven. Kyoto student action sequence is pretty fun. 8. Yuta said that in order for him to keep on living with his friend, he have to kill Ghetto, right? Yet he makes a pact or made a pact with Rika, sacrificing his own life to kill Ghetto. Yeah, a bit confused, but he has good intentions, so I'm not gonna touch on that. And oh, and um, I really like the I love is pure part. That was pretty nice. And the aftermath of their fight was pretty catastrophic. 
Like, if you didn't get a hint that you thought was really, really powerful, this is the part where you should realize that this boy is a bad news for every curse user out there. But I didn't expect Ghetto to die, cause he keep talking about what he would do next, even though he's already lost an arm. But did he die though? Because he came back. Did he came back to life like Yuji? But did he came back as a curse? Because he now, in the anime in season one, he was hanging out with curses. Hmm. Then comes the conversation between Gojo and Ghetto. Honestly, this makes me more emotional than any of Rika scene. I'm not saying that Rika like story was not emotional. It's just that this feel personal to me. I don't know why. Okay, I'm sorry, but these two Gojo and Ghetto they are on first name basis. They call each other by their first name, which means they are oh, were close friend, right? They were friends, and Gojo even trust that Ghetto would never kill. Inumaki and Panda. That's why he sent him back, or uh, sent them back to the school. And I guess I have a soft spot for this type of of thing. That's why it's so painful for me to watch. However, I really like the twist at the end about who Yuta actually is, and it is in fact him who cursed Rika, not vice versa. Like I said, even though I don't feel connect to these two. Yet, but I think this scene is emotional even for me because we can finally see the real Rika who actually mature and truly love Yuta, not the jealousy one. It's an emotional scene, but I didn't cry. But then they have to hit me with the my best friend and my only friend. Like, come on! <sighs> At the end, I like how this movie can be its own movie, like no cliffhanger. And if you don't want to see or if you don't want to watch the anime after this, you don't have to. The movie end perfectly on its own, and then the end credit rolling while King New songs was playing. I love both of the songs, and it's perfect for you the character. One was a painful love song, and the other was an upbeat song that gives you a fun and hopeful vibe. And the lyrics about doing whatever you want is so Yuta because at this point, after Rika was gone or is gone, he no longer have any commitment to restrict him. Right? I think if. Akutami Sensei did, didn't change the protagonist and add Sukuna in. It will be a story of Yuta and his Queen of Curse. So the fact that he already get rid of that problem, like find a way to release Rika, his problem in here. So now he can do whatever he want, especially when he is this OP. Unlike Yuji who's still all about saving as many people as he can. So yeah, like I said, this song was definitely for Yuta. Now into the post credit scene. I didn't even know that they have post credit scene. So the post credit, they open with a shot of Zebra. And I was like, are they going to show us Panda punching? Zebra? Because I thought this is supposed to be a zoo. And uh, remember that baseball episode? Panda, like, title card said that he wants to punch a zebra someday. And I thought they're gonna show us that. But no, it's actually Yuta and Miguel in Kenya. And I don't know what y Yuta was doing in Kenya or why Miguel is on Gojo. Sigh now? Was it because Ghetto died? And he was like, yep, time to switch side. Or did Gojo say something to him? I don't know. And I guess this is how we go going to start season two, right? This is how they're gonna come back to season two. It's a nice snippet for the uh, uh, anime watcher, people who want to continue watching after the movie. Overall, 
I enjoy this movie. I watched this movie with my friend, and I couldn't stop talking about it for like an hour after we got out of the uh, of the theater. I like it. I'm not going to rate it, and that's gonna do it for today's video. My camera just keep tilting. Tell me, what do you think of this movie? If I mean, if you watched it, if you already watched it. If you haven't, what are you doing here? So yeah, don't forget to stay safe, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye, guys.